Hello, this is Bob with County Records Research, and it's about 11.44 in the morning on Friday, March 17, 2017. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Hope where everybody's wearing green out there. Um, today is a special day. We're doing um, our webinar, of course, but we're also having a live event at the auction location in Chino. And... Um, we're going to be there, uh, Kurt's actually going to be there from about 12.30 until about uh, 2 o'clock today, uh, depending upon how many people are there, how many properties are going to sell. Um, actually, I, I did a search last week, and we had about 14 properties scheduled. That list has whittled down, and we're going to take a look at what has become of the list as we're speaking, because I think it, last time I checked it, it was down to about six properties that are set to go. So what we're going to do today, first of all, is we're going to take a look at properties that are going to today's auction to kind of get an idea of whether or not I would have been prepared to bid at the sale if I thought it was an opportunity or not but also to weigh what my options were prior to the auction. Remember one of the keys to doing deals on properties in foreclosure is that there's more than one way to skin the cat, there's more than one way to buy a piece of real estate, uh, whether you're interested in purchasing notes or bidding at the auction or simply going to the property owner and making an offer. The key is to isolate the properties that you're interested in based on the fact that the property owner or the lenders involved are in a sense of desperation and are willing to sell either the property itself or the loan at a discounted price. So bottom line is we're looking for the opportunity and county records research basically gives you the treasure map. You have to figure out where the treasure is and what you're willing to do to get it. So uh, that being said, let's kind of take the, uh, uh, the approach of finding what's there and then um, determining what are the best methods to get it. Uh, this is our deal building webinar, so let's get at it. Now, you can see the visual portion of our presentation. I'm going to click on my login option and open my account. So I'm just typing in my username and then my password. Now, notice below we've got our little CAPTCHA image. Sometimes people have an issue with this. It seems fairly clear to me, but, uh, you know, best laid plans of mice and men, right? So I'm going to go ahead and type in uh, the numbers and the letters as they appear to me. Now, if I'm wrong, it's going to tell me that my security word does not match. If I'm correct, it's going to say welcome, and we're off to the races. So I'm going to hit submit, and we're in. So I did get it right this time. And I'm going to say, don't remember my password. All right. Now, we're, uh, for today's demonstration, I did a little switch on you guys. Normally, I use Google Chrome, but we wanted to use Firefox today just to see how it looks in this different browser. So uh, this is uh, how the website looks in Firefox. Now, because I am doing um, a presentation using GoToMeeting software, we do have to scrunch the image up a little bit. So I've got my little window on the side that accommodates the GoToMeeting uh, control bar. So notice that it is going to be a little um, crunched up over to the side. So normally you're going to have a wider image uh, and I do have my little scroll bar here to the at the bottom that I can move it from left to right. Now, once I'm logged into my account, I can scroll all the way down. If you've joined us for any of our Wednesday presentations, you know what all these buttons down here are for. If you haven't attended a previous presentation or you're just seeing, uh, seeing this for the first time, remember that you can always go to our calendar of upcoming events at the lower left, click on it, and this gives you our live event list of events. Um, first of all, we have Kurt's presentation that he's doing today where he's in Chino at 1230. Secondly, we have a new event that uh, was recently scheduled in Pomona that's going to be on the week, uh, the 28th. So uh, up, um, you know, a little over a week from now, we're going to be, he's going to be in Pomona, which is the civic center for the city of Pomona, where the majority of your Los Angeles properties are sold. About 80 to 90 percent of your LA County properties are sold at this location. Okay. Okay. Below that are the links to join us for live presentations like we're doing 
today. Here's the link to join us today. If you came through the website, you know about this. If you're someone that's watching this presentation on our YouTube channel, it's important to know that we do live trainings every Wednesday and every Friday from 11.45 to 12.45. If those of you who haven't gone to our YouTube channel, just note that you can click on the link here to view the previous demonstrations. That launches you right over to our YouTube channel, and you can watch previous presentations of both Wednesdays and Fridays. Remember that Fridays are deal building. They're kind of more of a loosely knit presentation focused on doing deals, whereas Wednesdays we're just getting down and looking at the functions of the site, how we save searches, how we save properties, and just getting the website to do work for us by setting up saved search options and having the website send us leads each day. Uh, further below, it's going to be other speaking engagements besides our field trips where Kurt has been asked to speak at a live event. So the next coming event is actually going to be um, on Saturday the 25th in the morning. Usually we do evening events, but this is a morning presentation. And he's been invited to speak over in uh, East Los Angeles County in Baldwin Park. And he's going to be speaking there um, on, on that Saturday morning. Now, whenever we're asked to... Um, attend an event uh, with another party, that other party obviously is in control of the venue. So because of that, we always like to advise people, if we've been invited to speak at someone else's party, it's their party. And so therefore, it's going to be at their location of their selection, and they're going to maybe have some costs involved, like a door a door cost to enter the presentation, uh, and they might have a pre-registration option as well. This one seems to have those uh, rules. It's $20 at the door, and you can contact them if you want to pre-register, because it looks like you might be able to save a little bit by pre-registering. Again, this is their party. We're simply there as a guest speaker, uh, but you're going to learn quite a bit from Kurt if you attend the event, so we encourage you to do so if you can make it. Okay, so these are this is our calendar of upcoming seminars. Now, since I'm already logged into my account, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select the property search option. And it's going to take me to my property search screen. Now, this is my property search screen, which gives me access to all of my county zones that are under the tab for each state. So I've got California, Nevada, Arizona, Washington, and Oregon. Now, we're going to select California and we're going to select San Bernardino County. Now notice I'm selecting the checkbox to the right of San Bernardino County. We always want to check the box to the right, even though kind of intuitively we want to check the box to the left, but that would put me um, in uh, Madeira County if I check that box there. So notice we highlight the county in blue once we've selected it. Notice also if I put my cursor over the word county next to San Bernardino, I get a short list of cities within that county to make sure that I'm casting my, my hook and my reel into the right place and I'm trying to, to grab properties in the right location. So San Bernardino County is selected. Now if I scroll down a little bit, this is my single property search. Now this is one of my favorite tools of the site and we're going to use this in just a few moments. But I need a property before I can use the single property search because this is a very, very, a very specific search function on the site. What I'm doing is I'm researching further to see if there's more information related to a profile I've already found. Okay, so that said, we need to find some profiles and then move ahead. So I'm going to scroll a little further down to my general property search. This is the workhorse of the website. This is where we get most of our work done. And this is where I always get started when I want to see if there's new opportunities to take advantage of. Now, whenever I get to this section, there are two main selections in this grouping. There are actually a total of seven, but the two primaries are notice as a default and upcoming sales. Notice the default is the first stage of foreclosure. I like to call it the first shoot a drop because this is when the lender finally takes action because the borrower is not paying. Now these days the lenders are incredibly lenient. Uh, used to be if I missed a couple of payments that lender was all over me. Okay, And I would be getting phone calls, I'd be getting nasty letters. The lender would really want to know what the heck's wrong with Bob because he's not making his house payment. These days it's more likely that the lender is going to send me a few letters, maybe make a couple calls, uh, but they're going to be very, very soft in terms of how they target 
the borrower in terms of trying to get them to make their payments because first of all there have been so many foreclosures in the last decade um, that the lenders have realized that they can't simply willy-nilly jump into it. They've got to really take their time about it. Um, and they don't want to put more properties into default than they have to because as a, um, as a lender uh, that has a receivables um, file, I, I want to make sure that I keep as many receivables uh, on the good side of the ledger as possible versus throwing them all over to the bad side. So the lenders have been very cautious in terms of moving properties from, from one ledger to another. So you'll notice when, when you go and look at properties that have a notice of default these days, as a general rule, they're going to have a pretty extended amount that's owed. They're not going to be filing foreclosure because the guy's behind by $1,000. However, there are exceptions. Okay, There are some smaller lenders out there. They're private money lenders. There are people that are going to take action fairly quickly. So just bear in mind, that's one of your opportunities for note purchasing are the property uh, or the, the lenders that feel the pain right away. Okay, because if a lender feels the pain right away and they go to start a foreclosure, they might want to sell that note at a discounted price rather than wait out the whole process of foreclosure. Whereas a larger bank like Bank of America or Wells Fargo uh, might be more than happy to take their time about the processing of the foreclosure and they might not worry about that borrower standing in or uh, living in the property for a couple of years before they finally take it away. So that's one of the things that we always like to point out in the deal building webinar is that we're looking for opportunities, we're looking for the desperate party that uh, is more likely to engage with us when we make our presentation. So when I'm looking at the properties that are going to auction, that's another thing I'm looking at too, is, is this a homeowner that I can engage with? Will they be willing to look at my offer? Uh, or are they just in a, in a state of mind where they could care less? Okay, and I don't know necessarily in every situation, but I like to make some general um, estimations as to whether or not there's equity in the property or whether or not it's upside down and I'm making a short sale offer because when I'm making a short sale offer, remember that the seller gets nothing. Okay, if I make a short sale offer, the seller gets nothing. Therefore, oftentimes the homeowner is not as easy to engage. Now, if I'm a listing agent, I'm all over it, okay, because the listing agent is simply helping that homeowner get out of a fix, okay? They're in a, they're in a problem situation. So if I'm an investor, then I might be looking more likely for the properties that have an equity position or I might be going over there to make an offer for the simple purpose of doing investigation to see the condition of the home so I can set a value for buying at the auction. So now, when I get to this section, notice the default is already selected for me as a default, okay? So kind of pun intended, def our, our default is notices of default. Now, because a notice of default is the first stage of foreclosure, there's no auction date. Therefore, our system is giving me a listed date or, or an added date range to search from March 3rd to March 17th. So notice, whenever we search notices of default, we're looking in the rearview mirror. The date range goes from two weeks ago until today. So we're looking behind us because we post each day. So any new records in the system will be today's date, the 17th. So if I want to just search the last two weeks worth of NODs in San Bernardino County, I'd go down and I'd hit this little button here that says search without polygon. And just to point out, there's a map below. So I could create a polygon if I wanted to limit my search to a very finite area. If you want to look at how we do that, you can look at our previous presentations for Wednesdays. Wednesdays when I show you how to set up a polygon. And actually last Wednesday or, or this week, uh, we, had a, um, we did some demonstration on how to search auction properties. But last Wednesday, and that was uploaded to our, web, to our uh, YouTube channel, we did a nice polygon. Actually, we do polygons pretty much every Wednesday. Now, if I hit search without polygon on the NOD report, notice that what I get is I get a list at the bottom with the map on the top. And above the map, it's going to say map reflects or results from 
0 to 20 of, and then it's going to have a figure, in this case 224 records. So what this is telling me is in that rear view mirror of the last two weeks of notices of default, I've got 224 properties that just got brand new notices of default within that time frame of two weeks. So we're averaging, what, about 112 records every week. Okay, and you could break that down and say, okay, if, I, if there's only five days in a week, uh, I'm getting roughly, you know, 23 records uh, a day uh, for notices of default in San Bernardino County. Now, usually the number of properties that's going to go to auction in a two-week range is about uh, the same uh, or up to double that, depending upon how many postponements there have been. Okay, now these are my notices of default. So these are properties that I would go through and try and find which ones I want to go make offers on, knowing that the auction cannot happen for at least three months because a notice of default is the first stage of foreclosure. A lot of folks call that pre-foreclosure, but that's a misnomer. A notice of default is actually the first starting point in a foreclosure process, and that means the foreclosure has begun. Remember, a foreclosure is a collection action. Once I've activated the first stage, then I simply have to wait three months before I can issue the notice of sale. Now, I'm going to go ahead and close this record out. I can hit return to property search on the right below the map, or I can go up here to my tab and click on the little X. I'm going to do that, and that's going to close out that search result. Now, watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit upcoming trustee sales instead up here under choose one. And now what the system has just done it's moved from notices of default to upcoming trustee sales. It's gotten rid of those listed dates and given me auction dates instead. Now, before we jump in and see what's going to go to sale today, watch what I can do. I can get rid of those auction dates by clicking on the little blue check marks, and I can re-input those listed dates instead. Now, why would I do that? What if I wanted to get the freshest notice of sale leads because I want to go knock on doors. Well, uh, if I'm a listing agent or if I'm a, uh, an, um, someone that's interested in going and making offers directly home to homeowners to buy their properties and I want to get the freshest notice leads, then I could do this. So 3-3 three, three to 317 upcoming sales, no auction dates, remember, because you don't want to have dates in both boxes. If I hit the search button there, let's see how many I got. So. All right, I got about half the number. I got 131 notices of sale for that same target area, okay? So now notice also that it says 0 to 20 again, just like the last report did. So now if I scroll down, I can pick where it says right under the map on the left, show 20, 40, 60. Because it's a number greater than 20, I can click on the 60 and get a report. And now what I've done, just done is I've just added more properties to the total list per page. Now, because I'm now up to 60 per page of the 131, I'm now to two plus pages because there's going to be 60, 60, and that leaves another, what, 11 records on the next page, the third page, okay? So these are all properties that are on their way um, to the... Um, to the uh, foreclosure auction, but because I picked by the listed date, um, I'm only getting properties uh, based on um, when they were posted to the website. Now, because they are notice of sale records, notice there are sale dates here in the system, okay? And because I went all the way back to the third, we've actually got some that were set to go to auction and already sold. As a matter of fact, the four at the top here all sold to individual uh, bidders. So here's one in Apple Valley that uh, the bank was owed 307000 Now, this property was upside down. Okay, you hear a lot of, you hear people say that, that phrase, and upside down means that the amount that was owed the lender is greater than the market value of the property. In this case, market value is about 196000 right around 200,000. The bank was owed uh, another 100,000 over that. They were owed 307. They opened the, the auction at a lesser price and the sold amount was 156,400. So about 40,000, 400, yeah, about 40,000, excuse me, in equity 
um, was uh, acquired by the buyer at this auction with cashier's checks. The next one here in Needles, um, this property, um, now this is interesting. Notice this property in Needles, it's in here twice. Now I want to point this out because you don't see this every day, but when you do, it's important to note it. Notice there's a vacant lot, vacant miscellaneous land, and this address on San Luis Street. And if you look to the right, towards the center, notice the amount owed to lender, 48841 is not there once, but twice, okay? So, and then I look over to the sold amount, and I see the sold amount, 48000 924 and 85 cents. It's funny, it's always funny when you see it to the penny, right? Now, 48, 9, 24, 85 is there also twice. So, what happened here? This lender was owed the 48,841 at the time they created the, the notice of sale to schedule the auction for this property on San Luis Street and an accompanying vacant lot, both under the same loan. Now, this is a package deal. If one loan covers two properties, then the bidder at auction is acquiring both properties. Now, is it possible that I could have a loan that's in first position on San Luis and in second position on the vacant land or vice versa? You betcha. But in this case, not, the so, not so. The property was sold for 48 dollars and 85 cents for both properties. So this person paid about 48 k Now, according to this, the estimated value for the house on San Luis is 105000 So it looks like they got a property for less than half price, plus they got a vacant lot thrown in. This is a deal. So whoever did this buy, they knew what they were doing. They would have done their research and made sure that this was, a, uh, in fact, a foreclosing first, so it looks like they got a steal. Now, the very next property here in San Bernardino on Jeffrey Way, this one looks like it's worth about 260 The bank was owed 313 again, upside down. And in this particular situation, they reduced the bid again, just like the first property. The lender reduced the bid, and... Uh, they were willing to accept around 220. Now they opened it for less than this figure because if they had opened it for say 219 and nobody bid, this would be an REO. But notice it says sold. So all these properties sold to bidders, and we're talking the 13th for one of these properties, and then the property with the vacant lot and the one in San Bernardino, these both sold yesterday at the trustee's sale. So that being said, let's see what was going today, because right now in, in about uh, 25 minutes, Kurt's going to be um, 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 starting his presentation there. So I'm going to pick upcoming sales again. Now watch what happens also. This is important. Remember what I did. I picked upcoming trustee sales, and just to show you what you can do, I switched from the auction dates to the listed date. Now, if I want to go back to the auction dates, I don't have to play with the date boxes. I can just click the little button here that says upcoming sales. Watch what happens when I click it. It clears those old the listed dates out and goes back to the um, to the auction dates. Now, I'm going to do a little cheat because I know. Whenever I set an auction date search up with upcoming trustee sales, it's always going to start with today's date. Now, I want to search just today's auctions, so I'm going to keep that box the same. That's my cheat. And then I'm just going to take and click on the little calendar to the right of this end date because it's going forward to the 31st, and I don't want to do that. I want to take it back to today's date. So I'm just going to click on the calendar and click on today's date. So now it's March 17th to March 17th. Now I'm going to go down to where it says search without polygon and I'm going to hit my search button. Now what I did, now I could have selected only um, active sales. Now for the purposes of the demo, like I said I'm in Firefox, notice I got my tab up on top for the main page. If I click on that I can go back to see what I just did. So what I did is I picked upcoming sales I switched it to the 17th to the 17th. Now, I could have selected only active sales if I wanted to omit, uh, omit <laughs> the canceled sales from that report. But I don't mind seeing what got canceled for today. That's helpful to know. 
because most canceled sales are not resolved problems. Okay, remember this, it's important. Most of your canceled sales doesn't mean that the borrower has gotten out of the woods. Now, sometimes it means that they've accepted an offer and they've gone into an escrow, but lots of times it just means that the borrower has, um, has filed bankruptcy at the last moment or requested a modification. They've taken an action other than fixing their problem. Remember, um, there's a difference between the triage attempts of bankruptcy and modification requests uh, versus the actual solution to the problem, which is to uh, refinance or sell the property. If someone cannot afford their property, these, these triage attempts aren't going to fix the problem. They're just going to uh, cause that problem to continue forward. They're kicking the can. So now, uh, looking at my search results tab, notice all i do got to do is click on search results and I'm right back at my other page, right? Now, notice I have uh, a total above the map. It says 0 to 20 of 9. Now, whenever the total is less than the, the 20, obviously I don't have to click on anything down below because I've got the whole group listed. I also can see a dot on the map for each of the records. Notice the ones that are still pending are green, the ones that are canceled are going to be red. So I've got, looks like three, uh, three red dots, and I've got canceled and canceled at the top, and then towards the bottom I've got a house in Rialto on Brampton. That says paid off. Now I noticed this one earlier, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to leave um, the canceled sales off the record, just so that you know what this looks like when you see it. This property on Brampton is off the list because you have a $278,000 home with a $55,000 first and a $15,000 second. That's minimal. I mean, that's, that, that, that's, that's a percentage, a small percentage of the value of the property. So they could easily have sold this property or have refinanced it. So I'm going to click on the Brampton Avenue property, just to click on the profile and open it up. So we've got Clarence and Virginia Bulls. So Clarence and Virginia, let's see what their situation. Um, now, they bought the property. Now, I don't see the date that they bought it. For some reason, that's not appearing in my report. Okay, but there's a, there's a way that I can get around that. Uh, now, what I do see is I see that their loan from their first that foreclo was foreclosing was from 1993. That's an older note. Um, obviously, um, so what, did, what was their purchase price? Um, it's not showing me that either. So let's see if we can find an answer to that question. When did they buy this property? Um, and uh, let's find out. So what I'm going to first of all do is I'm going to click my link to Zillow. This has a reason, um, not necessarily for this estimate, although that can be beneficial in some situations, uh, to compare and contrast the estimate of value we give you. It's always helpful to have another opinion, but there's another reason we have the link to Zillow. I'm going to click on it and open the Zillow profile for this property. Now, what does this tell me? Uh, well, this is interesting. It says that this property sold for $90,000 on February 16th of 2017. Now, that's bizarre. Why would it have sold for $90,000 if it's actually worth 277? Well, a lot of times what happens is that you will have a property that sells inside the family or um, and, and what happens is they're, they're, they're just exchanging the property over in terms of who the ownership is unless you've got some other kind of negotiated deal here. It's not common for someone that has a property that's worth almost 300000 to, to to sell it uh, for about 33% of market value. Now, stranger things have happened, but let's see if we can find out a little bit more. So I'm going to scroll down the page, okay, and I'm going to see if there's information on the price and tax history. Okay, so very little here. All it says is that uh, the price history is February 16, 2017, $90,000. Doesn't tell me a heck of a lot. I'm, I'm actually surprised. Usually I get a, a nice laundry list of events, kind of like when you're looking at a checkbook register when I look at this price. So this is a very minimalist version of a Zillow page for this particular property. Um, and some general information. Um, so I, I got to say I'm curious. 
what I think is, since it, it looks like it just sold, it looks like somebody um, either bought this property by making some kind of an offer subject to the existing loans, okay, which is possible, um, in which case, um, here, let's take a quick look. First of all, you've got this 74000 in the 15. Uh, the 74 was only owed 55, so it looks like they were owed a total of uh, 55 plus another, you know, like uh, 5,000. So they were probably owed about 60. Um, I would be really shocked if they sold this house outright for 90,000. Um, I, I again, I, I kind of lean towards. I think that this was an, like an interfamily sale um, because one of the things that I'm noticing is we're showing that there was a transfer of title through Zillow, but it wasn't shown that it was listed with an agent. It just sold that it showed that it sold for 90,000. That usually means that it's a private party sale. Somebody made an offer here. Now, what was the total sum of that offer? I got to guess it's more than 90,000, uh, at least for the home benefit of the homeowner, I hope so. Now, if this transaction did close, as it looks like it did, then the sale was paid off and the, the, the auction was canceled. Now, had this been myself, I would have made an offer. Uh, I would have checked my market value. I would have checked my comps. Now, let me hit Zillow one more time because I do like to see what they said. Now, Zillow's estimate was right in line with our market value of about 270. Okay. Now, I'm going to go back up on top and I'm going to zoom in. Now, I'm using the wheel on my mouse. I like it because it gives me more control, but I can also use these little buttons here on the left if I'm using a tablet or a phone. Now, once I zoom in and hit my bird's eye, I can see the property. Okay. Not terrific, but not bad. Looks like you've got a residential home with a swimming pool. Okay. I don't know what this is over here. Looks like new construction just on the other side of the fence. Okay, but this is, you know, little, uh, you know, um, tract home. So um, I got to say, if market value was about 277, I really would doubt that they would sell it for 90. Uh, I think it's more likely that, like I said, that this was some kind of an interfamily transfer where uh, somebody took it over. Uh, you know, and you could have, you know, now look at the owner. It was originally the borrowers were Clarence in Virginia. The owner is Virginia, so maybe Clarence is no longer in the picture. And it's possible that Virginia sold it to uh, a son or daughter. Okay, which, uh, again, if you're in a family and, you know, mom has a house that's worth three times what she owes and, and she can't pay, make her payments, or she's in a position where she's no longer functioning um, and maybe the, the kids take over the property and, uh, and keep mom, you know, in a room and, and she has someone that can come in and take care of her. I think that's the situation here. I think this opportunity is probably off the table. Now, if you were still interested in it, you could go to the home and see if you could figure out what happened here. Um, Cause it could be that Virginia simply refinanced. Okay, if she simply refinanced, then the question is, did she just, or, or did they just transfer title to someone else within the family and, and they only sold it for the 90,000? In which case you could say, hey, I'm willing to pay you 150 or 200,000 for this place. If it's really worth 270 something, there might still be a deal here. Okay, hard to say. If I was a realtor in the area, I would go there with my nice smiley face and I could see if I could get the listing. Okay, just to find out what's going on, to be aware of it because they could be fine for a couple of years and then need to list the property and then they've got your business card and you're halfway there. Okay, so I'm going to close that one out and let's just move back up to the top of the list. So the first one on the list is on Eaglewood Place in Rancho Cucamonga. This sale got canceled. This was set to go today at 1.30. It's not going to happen. Now, this one, I'm going to tell you, this is, this is a boomerang. This one's coming back, and let me tell you why. Eaglewood Place is a four-bedroom, three-bath on a nice large lot, 19,000-square-foot lot. The value is about 669000 However, 
they're owed, they owe over a million dollars. And I can tell you that because the first is, is 940000 That's the foreclosing first. And there's a second behind it. Now, notice that we have a loan position column. Most of the time, you're going to see a foreclosing first on a property. Sometimes there's a second, and even in frequent less frequently there's a third. Most of the time it's a first. Now, in this case, we've got a foreclosing first that's owed the 940000 That's your amount owed. Remember, the amount owed lines up, to, lines up to the loan position. Now, to the left of the loan position, you have our senior junior loan column. So notice, whenever we look at our senior junior loan column, I, I like to explain this because it's important and it's helpful for you to comprehend what this report's telling you before you even open the listing profiles, okay? Because notice, we say senior slash, there's a slash symbol, and then junior loans. The reason we're doing that is we want you to know that the loan that's foreclosing is represented by the slash itself. So when there's a foreclosing first, you're always gonna see a zero ahead of the slash because the first is the senior loan. It's the oldest loan on the, on the, on the property. Therefore, because the slash represents that first, anything ahead of it is an empty set. There's nothing there. It's zero dollars. So the first is represented by the slash. After the slash are seconds and thirds. That's your 145. So if that 145 was there when they bought the property, the loan that's foreclosing in first position that's owed the 940, I got to ask myself, if they're in foreclosure, are they paid roughly current on that first, or are they behind? And if they're behind on the first, aren't they behind on the second? That's why I'm guessing they owe over a million dollars. Because if I put these two numbers together, they owe about 985. Oh, I take that back. They owe, <laughs> they owe about a million eighty-five. Let's see what they really owe. Because here, again, I'm going to tell you, this is a boomerang. This property is coming back. So I'm opening up the property. Wow, this is a, this is a this is a uh, this is an amazing one. That nine hundred and forty thousand dollar loan that that was foreclosing, that was a five hundred and eighty thousand dollar loan. These people have not made a payment in years, and that's with an S. Remember what I told you about leniency on behalf of the big big lenders. Wow. So this five hundred eighty thousand dollar first has nearly doubled. This is an 07 loan. So now James or Jaime Garado and, or Gonzalez Garado. Okay, you got you got a couple of names here. Jaime and Paola uh, Garado Gonzalez. Okay. Bottom line is this: <laughs> however many names they've got, you've got two loans here from 2007. These loans are 10 years old. Okay. They stopped making payments probably about eight years ago, okay? And that's why this 580 is all the way up to 940. Now, if the 580 has doubled, the 145 has doubled as well, okay? These folks are well over a million dollars on this place, okay? Now, also, um, notice the date above their names for the listing date of this record in our system, March 4th of 2016, that's a year old. Now. If I scroll all the way down, that's what I thought. Notice what we have here. The initial sale date was March 21st of 2016, and these people are players, okay? This is what I said. When you're looking at the situation, if you go to make these folks an offer, they're going to laugh at you. They haven't made a payment in years and years and years. Do they care? No. Their credit's, their credit's trashed, and they're living for free. So they're going to stay there until they have to leave. Okay, you can make them an offer, but good luck. You could go and try and get the listing as an agent. Uh, chances are they're going to stay there as long as they can. Okay, so just remember they're staggering this thing out. They don't care. Now, this sale date that was set to go today, the reason it got canceled is that the notice of sale has expired. Whenever you have a notice of sale on a property, it has an initial sale date. In this case, it was March 21st of last year. Now, They've done something to push this sale past today's date, whether it's a bankruptcy filing because they've added a new party to the title of the property. That's probably what they did. Because notice, the trustor is Jaime Garrado, but the owners, there's, there's multiple names here. 
okay so you probably have multiple um, uh, filings of bankruptcy to prevent the foreclosure from going ahead because bankruptcies always put a pause button on the process so again these folks are not novices they've been doing this for a long time to show you what I mean I'm going to use the single property search remember what I said so now I'm going to left click and drag to the left to uh, copy my APN or assessor's parcel number I'm going to put my cursor over the number, right click, and select the option to copy. Now I'm going to go back up on top and I'm going to select the main page tab on the far left and that's going to take me to my main page and then I'm going to just go up top and I'm going to select the parcel number option under my single property search and I'm going to select the paste option. Now whenever I do this I always have to make sure that the left digit in the sequence of numbers in my parcel number is always flush to the left hand side of the margin. It is, so I'm cool. So now I'm going to select the search option. Remember third box down, this is a parcel number. I'm going to hit search and this gives me my foreclosure wrap sheet on this property. Again, when I'm dealing with someone that hasn't made a payment in an extended period, then I'm always going to go back historically and look at their records because I want to check a few things. Are there multiple foreclosures pending because they have multiple loans? That's always possible. Okay, but also I want to just see historically what kind of activity has been happening on this property. So what do we see? These folks have been in foreclosure literally for seven years years remember what I said okay haven't made a payment in a long 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 time okay this notice of default was issued in September of 2010 now every record after this is a notice of sale if you've joined us for our Wednesday presentations you know the difference a notice of default has no sale date a notice of default has no bid amount it's simply the first shoe to drop in a process of foreclosure now every record after that is a notice of sale record where the lender has tried to establish a sale date and they've told us what's owed. Now the interesting thing I like about looking at this record, notice the estimated minimum bid grows over time. That's because these folks don't make their payments and they literally stopped paying seven years ago. Okay, these are, these are no pikers. They know what they're doing. Okay, so now this $609,000 figure here from 2010, December of 2010, has escalated by $330,000 when they got their notice of sale that was issued a year ago. So now it was up to 940 a year ago, and they still don't make their payments. So if they're adding about five grand a, a month to this figure, uh, figure they're up to about um, gosh they're 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 close to uh, a million easily on this first okay and they're still going they're still in the property they just got a sale canceled okay believe me if you go to talk to these folks they're living the life of Riley they're you're, you you could try okay I'm not saying don't I'm just saying use it as an exercise don't assume that they're gonna sign anything and I would not be surprised if the moment you open your mouth they ask you for money because these folks know what they're doing so be careful don't give them any cash you can make an offer okay but what's the most likely scenario here is that there will be a new notice of sale that will come out in the system these folks will be set to go to auction but they won't go to auction until they've exhausted all their potential legal parameters and the lender has finally gotten the last bankruptcy filing thrown out and literally taken them to auction by the skin of their teeth. Okay, so again, whenever I look at these, I always ask myself, should I focus on trying to buy this property from the property owner? The answer is no. Uh, now, if I close this record, this list out, and go back to the property profile, select portfolio servicing. This is a servicer. Um, again, if I had wanted to um, look at the uh, who owns the loan, one of the things I look is that I go all the way back to that notice of default, all the way back from seven years ago, and I click on that to open that profile, and I'll scroll down. Oh, it still says select portfolio. So this select portfolio is your point of contact, but they're also using a company called... Um, quality loan service down in San Diego because that's the actual address here so select portfolio is the servicer on this note 
Um, I would say probably most likely scenario here is that um, this needs to go to auction. When it does, because the lender has been so abused by these borrowers, I think it's very likely that at this auction you're going to find the lender is going to discount this greatly. And that now I'm going to also use the mapping function and go down here and take a look. Wow, when did they buy this? This was built into, they are the original owners. Wow. So they bought this place. Looks like brand new. Look at these photos. The, the bird's eye, it's, 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 uh, it's before they even built the property. Wow, okay, so now I just used the aerial. Here's another point. When the bird's eye doesn't work, go to the aerial, and you'll at least get an idea. So this is, um, so they got a nice house, and, and they're working it. Wow, they got a really nice house. And um, let's see if this is listed. Let's click on Zillow just to see. Now Zillow says the place is worth 800. My gosh, and these folks haven't made a payment uh, in 10 years, I mean in seven years. Chances are the lender's gonna need to discount this quite a bit. Yeah, they bought it in seven in 2007 for 725. It looks like they were the second owner. It was sold in 05 for 620. They bought it for seven and a quarter. Okay, so they bought it for seven and a quarter, and that's exactly what they borrowed. No skin in the game. Wow, these guys are good. These guys are really good. So I gotta tell you, this has gotta go to auction. These folks have to get kicked out. That's all that's gonna happen here, right? And because it's a servicer that owns this first, first of all, there's no equity in the second. Don't chase it. Um, you wanna buy this one at auction. There's no other option here. Uh, Carla had a question. If a BK is filed, is there a way to make an offer to the BK trustee? You know, that's a good question, Carla. Folks like this are not seriously filing bankruptcy, okay? Uh, first of all, they owe more on the property on the first loan than it's worth. They owe a million dollars now on this first, okay? Um, they file bankruptcy as a gimmick. It's a con. Okay, what they're doing is they're buying themselves time. They have no intention of completing the bankruptcy filing. If they did, they would have to list all of their assets outside the real estate, and they have no intention of doing so. That's not their game. Their game is simply to stay there as long as they can. Okay, again, the lender gets one bankruptcy thrown out, and then another bankruptcy is started. That's why they keep adding people to the, t to the names on the property. Okay, bottom line is this, this will go to auction eventually, and it's at that point that this becomes the opportunity because this lender, they've been raked over the coals, they've had enough, okay, but this process is not over until these folks have exhausted all their opportunities. What's going to happen eventually is a bankruptcy judge is going to tell them enough, okay, and until that happens, this process will probably continue. Okay, when it's over, this will go to auction and I guarantee you this lender will discount this property and that's where your deal's gonna be, okay? So that's what I would be following this one for. Now, notice the option you have on the bottom here of the profile. Select the status change option, put your email address in here. Because this lender is not gonna let go of this. I mean, if, you, if you've been raked over the coals like this, you'd be upset too, all right? This lender is going to send out another notice of sale, okay? Now, it's a servicer, mind you, and they're servicing a loan that's probably been securitized, and um, they're not going to sell the individual note as a residential note. They're going to take it to auction. That's their best choice. Well, that's a good question. I think I just answered it, Bob. The... Um, the servicer is servicing the note. It's most likely, like I said, securitized. And because it's probably pooled and securitized, um, what's gonna happen is the best thing the parties in this case can do is simply um, liquidate the, the asset that's connected to the, the mortgage-backed security and then pay the parties that are uh, 
owners of that mortgage-backed security because that ownership is spread across a lot of resource, a lot of parties, okay? Hedge funds, a lot of pension funds are involved in these types of uh, commitments. So it's very likely that select portfolio is going to get whatever cash they get from the auction and then have to distribute it accordingly because that's what trustees do at the close of a trustee sale. And in the case of a, of a, of a, a securitized or pooled note like this, then they redistribute it into that securitized product so everybody gets their monies, okay? Uh, so bottom line is this, that's why when you go after a situation like this, if it doesn't look, if, if it's a serviced note, chances are if you tried to reach out to select portfolio and buy the note as a, as a, junior, as a lender buyout, they would not be able to separate it from the pool. They would simply have to take whatever cash they can get and distribute it into that pool so the, the servicer of that pool can distribute those funds accordingly. Okay, and I got, I got to tell you, the, the amount of complication involved in, in those kind of securities is over my head, uh, and I just recommend in a situation like that, be aware that the most likely scenario is that this lender will take it to auction when they, when they finally can, and when they do, they're going to set a price point to make it attractive because they simply want a buyer to pick this property up. And if this place is only worth about six sixty nine, like our system is showing, or what does Zillow say? Zillow said more. Zillow said 806. Now, notice the difference. If you've got 806 versus 669, that's a pretty big gap. So make sure you check your comps. Also, be aware if they haven't bought, if they haven't made a payment to their lender in seven years, what are the odds are the place is kind of run down? Okay. Now, obviously, it's a fairly new property, and they were only the second owner, and the first one was only owning it for two years. Okay, but this place could be pretty run down depending upon how many people they've had in the place and if they've been renting rooms out, okay, because obviously they're, uh, they're, they're taking advantage of living there for free. It's probably very likely that they're using the property itself as a money maker as well. So you got to be careful. You got to know that this place is going to be run down. If you go in and take it over, you're probably going to need to spend some money. If you're going to go make an offer, do so for the purposes of investigating the condition of the property, and be aware that you're probably going to bid at, a, at an auction sometime in the next six months or so, because it might take that long to shake this out. If the lender finally has had enough, and more importantly, if the bankruptcy judge has finally said no more, okay? Because this has been going on for a long time. Okay, so I'm going to close this one out because this is taking up a lot of the time and we're down to our last 10 minutes of the presentation. I'm going to see if I can move through these last ones. Let's see what we can close out a little faster. So Mulberry Avenue in Upland, this is another property. Similar situation, $528,000 property. Lender was owed eight ninety dollars on the first. Woohoo! Uh, and the second is supposedly $243,000. This is a mirror image of the one in Rancho Cucamonga on Eaglewood. Let's open Mulberry. And again, I'm, I'm going to tell you, this is probably a mirror image. And sure enough, Alex and Arminda Martinez. And notice the owners, Alex and Arminda et al. They've been adding people on and filing bankruptcies. Okay, so we've got a first of 520 that's grown to 890. The first is from 05. Let's see what we got down here below. Uh, purchase date 02, these are refinance loans. These are money makers. They are, uh, this is a business. This house is their business. They're, they're doing well. Okay, so now the first is 520, it's grown to 890. There's a second of 243.5 from 06. Want to bet that one's grown too? Okay, remember, if the first is doubled, so is the second. These folks owe over a over million dollars on this place. Okay, and I'm going to scroll in, hit my bird's eye. Corner house, ooh, nice. Look at the um, the biology experiment that used to be a swimming pool there here in the corner. Okay, so um, again, it is what it is. Understand you're gonna probably take a property over that's gonna have a lot of work because it's been abused, because these people, you know, if I'm not paying my lender, I'm not fixing anything. Um, and you know, bottom line is you know you know your know your parties know what you're dealing with. Now, notice also the list of date here, February twenty second, twenty sixteen, and a canceled sale. Scroll down. 
sale date March 28, 2016. Current sale date March 17th. They got the sale canceled. So another bankruptcy. They pushed the sale back. They bought themselves more time. Let's go ahead and um, do a quick search with the single property search parcel number. Okay, just to see what we can see. And you're going to see why I do this. Bingo. So this process of foreclosure began back in 2009. Okay, went from 572, 661, 76. Okay, we same mirror image of that last property. Not even worth pursuing. Okay, this one's going to go to auction. There'll be a new notice of sale that'll come out because the only way you're going to get these people out because again they're fleecing the property, they're fleecing their lender. They know what they're doing. Okay, so let's go back to the, let's go to the next one. Flathead Road in Apple Valley. Now, shock, surprise, here's a property with equity. Here's a property you can make an offer on because these folks are normal, okay? They're not, they're not uh, using their, uh, their property to take advantage of other parties. This property on Flathead Road, they, it's worth about 182. The amount owed is about 137. Okay, there's equity in the property for closing first, but notice on this one, zero slash zero. There is no second. If I open up Flathead, Okay, now what do I got here? I got Stephanie Kaiser as the borrower. I've got Brian Daniels as the owner. So that is kind of odd that we have a different owner than the trustor. Now, that also tells me I need to be careful because we want to have a creative person here too. Notice my purchase date's missing like that one. Okay, so now I'm going to grab the parcel number on this one because what do I think that's odd here? First of all, the loan is from 2012 for 137. They currently owe about 137, so this is about a five-year-old note, and they owe about the amount that was borrowed. But I'm not seeing a purchase date, so is it possible that there's senior debt? So I'm going to take that parcel number, go back up, do the single property search, hit search. Okay, and that takes me now. I only see two records here. I see the notice of default that's from 20 November. That seems pretty straightforward. We see a notice of default. So there were only 5,000 in arrears. So it looks to me it's possible that uh, Stephen, okay, wait a second, Stephen Kaiser and Brian Daniels, and this says Stephanie Kaiser. So that could be a typo. Um, let's check the Zillow really quick. See if this property is listed off the market. Zillow says it's worth about 182. I just want to see if there's any other information I can glean before I do anything else. So now the last time this was sold was 2003 for 140,000. So what does that just tell me? It was purchased in 03. The loan is from 2012, and it was a transfer from Stephanie or Stephen to Brian. Before I do anything at this point on this property, I would make a call to title, cross-check my loan data because there's something hinky here. There's something that doesn't make sense. I do want to make sure if I was going to bid at auction that I'm certain what the loans are. So I would have checked this out before now because obviously the auction is pending when it's set to go. It's at 1 o'clock. It's in about 15 minutes, 18 minutes, right? So. If I was going to buy at this auction, there's a loan from 2012, and I know my purchase date's 2003, and they transferred title. So I would call the uh, um, a title company. I'd say, do you see this loan from 2012? And they're going to say, yeah. And I'm going to say, um, do you see any senior loans on this property? Because if I'm going to go bid on the auction, I want to know. Now, if I'm going to go make an offer to Brian, I, I don't care. Flat out, I don't care. Now, uh, also, do I see who the lender is on this one? I'm going to scroll down. Central Mortgage Loan Servicing is the lender. So now I could reach out to them if, uh, if this gets postponed. Okay, now this could get postponed. Notice the initial sale date is the current sale date. This could get bumped out. A lot of times they do. In fact, a lot of people don't realize lenders will bump these, uh, these auctions out of their own accord with no impetus from any other resource, the lender can bump this out one or two or three or four times simply because lenders have a policy of structuring 
and staggering out their um, their foreclosure auctions so they don't take everything back all at once. So you notice they're staggering stuff out. That's why people say, oh, there's postponements and cancellations. What's up with that? Well, part of it is bankruptcy filings. Part of it is that people are getting modifications. Part of it also is that the lenders want to stagger out the properties that they take back into their inventory so that they can then return that inventory to the market in the forms of an REO and they don't want to have to do so in huge lots. They want to do it in staggered um, figures. So, And bottom line is if, they, if right now they have too much inventory on hand, they're going to simply stagger those sales out so they don't take back properties until they've sold the others. Okay. So again, it's business. Business is business. You, you control your inventory flow. And that's what they're doing. So I would do my research on the title information. I'd see if maybe I could reach out to the lender if this gets postponed, uh, possibly to see if I could buy the note. Um, but uh, if this is the only loan on the property, then chances are when it goes to auction, the lender might discount even further than the 137. Okay, remember um, that the lender can always set a lower figure. Um, they cannot ask for more than what they're owed, but they can ask for less and they often do. And that's why we have a bidding service in LA County where the volume is higher um, because we have a lot of clients that get deals every week because they simply say, this is the most I'm willing to spend. They, once they've set that price point, they give us a bid and then we lock that property down. We're going to look at one more. This is a property in Chino Hills, and I want to make a point with this one because I've looked at it before. This is a foreclosing second. Okay. Now, not everybody bids on seconds. The thing to remember about a foreclosing second on a property is this. Usually it gives you an opportunity to get in with less cash and take over payments on an existing first. Now, I've got to tell you, I've looked at this one, this property before. The estimated value is about 966 or close to a million dollars. The loan in second position is owed about $212,000. The loan in first position, see the slash, the second is the slash, the $500,000 is senior, so that's the first. Now, because I've looked at this property before, watch what happens. I've looked at this before so I know the second of 220 originally from 10 years ago is down to 212. That means that number's gone down as opposed to those other records, those first two properties where those people were using their house as a cash cow. In this situation, the Perez family has uh, been paying their loans down over the years and they've fallen behind recently. This is an opportunity to approach the family because we're showing they owe about 720. I think they actually owe closer to about 710 on a property that's worth approximately 966. Okay, this is your opportunity across the board. Make an offer to the homeowner to buy their property because they have plenty of equity. They have over 200K in equity. Why not go for the deal? If this went to auction today, would I be prepared to bid on it? You bet. Okay, so the, auction, the option was to bid at the auction having about two to $300,000 in cash, or cashier's checks, excuse me, at the auction today. If this gets postponed, go to the family, make an offer go to the holder of the second and see if they're willing to sell the note. Go to the holder of the first, see if they're willing to sell their note, okay? Every option is on the table when you have equity in a property and you've got a foreclosing second and you've got a family that probably has been making earnest payments for years and just hit a crisis because that family in crisis needs a solution and that solution could be you. This is Bob at County Records Research. Thank you so much for joining us for our Friday deal building webinar. Hopefully you gleaned a few tips from this that will help you with your research. Remember that every property is an opportunity. If you're not sure where the opportunity lies with the property, call us. The 800 number is at the top of the page for a reason. We want to help you, we want to guide you, and we want to help you get your next deal.